Hello, I'm here to talk about the hero generation and uh, happiness in schools and not just in developing character and emotional intelligence in students, but also thinking about how we can empower and create happier teachers, schools, systems. So why me? Why am I here? There's lots of experts. People in social media claim to be experts on a variety of different topics. Um, I could claim a, to be an expert in the topic of happiness, but I think that's a bit absurd. Um, but I do have a story that I want to share, and it's why I am so passionate and why I care so much and why I'm in front of you today. So it's uh, based on these three things here, West Nile, swine flu, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. So in 2009, my husband contracted all three of these. First, West Nile, and then uh, swine flu, and then as a post viral illness, he contracted Guillain-Barre syndrome. And bef just before that, he had been playing pro lacrosse. He was a pro athlete. We had moved to San Jose because of his, um, his uh, athletic pursuits. And only two years before that, or about a year before that, he had beat the US after 28 years of losing. Canada finally beat them in the World Cup. So he was at the peak you know, condition. He was playing professionally, and then one day he couldn't get up off the floor. He had firefighters break down the door. They rushed him to ER. And when I arrived, they informed me that this um, was his diagnosis. We didn't know if he was going to live. Guillain-Barre syndrome can kill, so can West Nile, so can swine flu. After three days of not being totally certain if he was going to be with us and, uh, and our child, who was two years old at the time, and I was also pregnant at eight and a half months with our second, something clicked and he survived and the treatment worked. But they told us at that point that he may not walk again. And as an athlete, that is also devastating. That's terrifying. But what ended up happening was that he decided at that point that that diagnosis wasn't gonna take him out. And so he just made a point to change. Whatever was gonna happen at that point was gonna happen. So let's take this illness on in the best way that we possibly can. So he called out to all of his friends. He said, what can we do to uh, make me feel better? This is, you know, kind of sucking. So what can I do to feel better? And uh, everyone rallied and they said, practice gratitude. And all the literature in the books that we read said the same thing. So we practiced gratitude. Jim, decided that he was not going to be ungrateful, no matter what, because he was alive. So he started saying he was grateful for uh, his bed sheets being changed in the hospital. He was grateful for us showing up for co with coffee every morning. He was grateful for the OTs and the PTs that were giving him extra help. Uh, and what translated was that everyone rallied he himself felt that energy of support and he worked harder. And after six weeks, he walked out of the hospital unassisted. We moved back home because we were grateful for healthcare at that point after living in San Jose. <laughs> OHIP was awesome. Moved back and we started using our children as psychological experiments because we really wanted to understand what this was that propelled Jim to heal and why everyone wanted to, to help him. So um, Wyatt, we asked him every day at the end of school, before dinner, what are you grateful for? At first, he said whatever was around the table, ketchup, you know, chicken nuggets. I always regret that we didn't eat kale that night when I retell this story. <laughs> chicken and, and, and ketchup. And then after about two weeks of him practicing, uh, acknowledging that there was a report at the end of that, you know, at the end of his day before, uh, before we ate dinner, he decided that he was going to start to pay attention in the day. So he was creating this gratitude hygiene, this happiness hygiene, and he started to notice things. And about two weeks in, after practicing it every day, creating this habit, he started to say things that started the beginning of his day. His walk into school that morning was awesome because he ran into one of his friends and then he got this really cool uh, 
a game that he got to play, and he got to get an extra time uh, on the computer, and that was really awesome. And you know, he started reciting all of these really great things. But what we realized is that he was developing the fluency and gratitude. And so we went back, went to Laurier, and uh, started to learn about what that was. We brought it into schools. We spent some time asking kids what they were grateful for. And some of the most incredible things come out of kids when you ask them what they're grateful for, and when you ask them to focus on the positive, when you ask them to tell them what intrinsically motivates them, the most incredible words come from our kids. So when we lack psychological safety, what, is, what does that mean? What happens when we lack psychological safety, when we're not spending our time thinking in the positive, when we're being um, pessimistic instead of optimistic? What happens is we go into a state of fight or flight. So a long time ago, there were saber-toothed tigers and they would eat our food, and they would kill us. And so now, even though there's no longer any saber-toothed tigers around, we still have this negativity bias. We're still, uh, in a, we still develop the same response to stress and fear as we would in those days when there were saber-toothed tigers. So what happens when we are in fear, we shut down parts of our brain that protect us uh, from these scary animals and that forces us to protect ourselves by running away or fighting. Um, unfortunately, now there's a lot of stress out there that isn't going to kill us, but it will eventually if we don't deal with it. And when we are in a place of psychological safety, we can create, we can innovate, we are so much more able to teach and also to learn. It's unfortunate right now how stressed out teachers actually are. Educators are highly stressed. And that isn't because of you know, all the things that they do have to deal with. They are handling stakeholder relations. They are people that are managing small businesses. They, are, they have customers that can sometimes be unruly. And what that is translating into is high, high levels of stress. And the thing is, is that educators are actually highly empathetic. And that actually can be the most wonderful thing, and yet it can be a curse. Because that empathy ends up turning into depletion if there's no way of building up the psychological fitness that can handle all the stresses of being a teacher. And you know, when you're at work, sometimes you just, it's very difficult to stay happy. And if you have, you know, a tough morning, or there's been a, a situation where you have had to maybe argue with, a, or I wouldn't say argue, maybe discuss strongly with a parent, something that might not have gone so well with their child, or you've had to deal with um, someone that you really thought was going to be successful in a, in a test or in school, and they're not doing as well as you thought that they were going to. And we feel empathy, and that creates so much stress inside of us. And so it's difficult to stay positive. And that translates into unhappy students because we are lie detectors. Our bodies can detect students and adults, grown-ups, are just as susceptible to, uh, to feeling the stress of their students as students are to feeling the stress of the teachers that are, are in their space. Like Ekman and, you know, in books that come out of um, really great authors, like scientists um, that, uh, that wrote the, the research for Blink, we are susceptible to other people's stress. And the thing is, is that we have the ability to train these psychological traits. Our whole brain is so ripe for learning and for training if we create the habits of that. So what we did is we came up with the hero generation. It's a model that's based on Martin Seligman's uh, model PERMA, which was positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. We took a lot of that science that's been around for a really long time and we built the hero generation. And that is uh, modeled as hope, efficacy, resilience, optimism, gratitude, uh, empathy, and we also look at mindfulness. So hope, when we look at hope and bringing that into the curriculum, we look at hope as an active trait. When a child has hope, they know how to move around obstacles. They know that they have the ability, even if they haven't done well in one uh, part of their um, part of their testing, that there is a way for them to improve that. And efficacy, 
very important for a child to have efficacy. It's being able to recognize their weaknesses. It's like growth mindset and the ability to overcome. Resiliency, it's okay to fail. You know, you can have a bad mark, but that if you have the ability to be resilient, then you know that there's other ways around that. You see challenges you know, and as opportunities. Optimism is so important. That's that belief that you can um, accomplish everything that you put your mind to. And it's not a rational optimism. It isn't not putting your seatbelt on when you get in the car because you think, you know, you just are optimistic enough that it's not going to result in a car crash. It's not irrational. It's about being able to use positive emotions to be effective. Gratitude, extremely important. We actually look at gratitude, and what we've learned in our research is that gratitude is this kind of grand daddy trait to happiness. It's the thing that you need to have in your life and practice in your life to become the, the happier person that you had aspired to be. Empathy, so important, mirroring emotions. If we as educators can be heroes, then what is reflected back to us are students that are heroes, and it needs to be reciprocal and holistic. Mindfulness, if we can give our students time, time, a minute a day is all it takes for them to have a quiet moment of reflection. That changes so much of the outcomes of their academic success. And so what we did in this 21-day gratitude intervention is we tested this hero generation. We had students spend four, um, within uh, about four weeks they spent, and we asked kids from grade one to grade eight what they were grateful for. And in this experiment, we had them either draw pictures or we had them um, write down what they were grateful for. And when they did this intervention, what was most amazing from the teacher's perspective is they learned what intrinsically motivated the students. They learned that dogs make up about 30% of a child's happiness. They realized that candy on some days can actually make a child really happy and that it also can be their sibling, even though that was moderately, uh, sh that shifted. Um, but we did see that gratitude is a way for an educator to motivate. So when you start to see that this, this child writes about something that they're excited about, 16 out of the 21 days, then you know that that child should be encouraged and taught in the way that they're motivated, they're most intrinsically motivated by. And it gave so many teachers different lines of communication. It also opened up the ability for them to ask a student when they couldn't find something that they were grateful for, the why behind that. Lots of really important conversations came out of a child not being able to find those words of gratitude. We also found that with 10 weeks of gratitude journaling for adults, same thing. 10 weeks of gratitude journaling increased engagement. It increased by 35%. It increased the desire and the connection to be in this, their environment with other, you know, with their peers and with their students. It was so significantly relevant that we had to start applying it at both ends of the spectrum. And now we're working with teachers and with students and figuring out how those two pieces of um, effort combined create higher academic achievement. So why should we care? This kid who has his S backwards, but who cares? He has his S backwards, but look, at he's so happy to be learning to spell. And we focus so much on writing that S so that it's perfect. But what does that really matter? He just loves to learn. He's excited. He wants to be spelling. You know, and what kid writes a gratitude that says learning to spell? When, when they love school, that's what they say they're grateful for. You know how many times we saw notes that said, I'm grateful for my teacher? Thousands. Bacon was also one that we saw a lot. But. <laughs> Teachers are significantly impactful on a child's life and bacon. So just come to school with bacon and it'll be fine. But this is what is so special about this is that that S will get right, it'll get right, it'll get turned around as long as you are building up their psychological fitness so that they can embrace being wrong 
and then you can make them feel that school is a place that is joyful and happy and wonderful and a great place to be. Because really, that's when the, the, fi the fight or flight and that cognitive load and the brain opens up and innovation happens and creativity happens and school becomes a place of happiness. And when you spend so many hours there, shouldn't it be a place of happiness? And not just for the students, but for teachers too. So education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. This quote is so impactful because we look at the ability to change the world through education. We know that to be true. But how do we set up our students and teachers and our schools for success to change the world? If this is so important and it is the thing that will be the catalyst for change, we need to make our teachers, our schools, our students happy to be there, excited to be there, grateful for being there because it's a mission we're on. We're on a journey and we're trying to do it together. And if we create a place that is safe and psychologically safe for all of us, then we can actually change the world. And I look forward for all of us doing that together. Thank you.